Hi, I'm Quinn and I'm Autistic. Welcome to Autistomatic. Ever since autism was first established as a diagnosis back in the 1940s, academics and scientists have theorised about us. They've dissected our brains and sequenced our genomes, and despite decades of published papers and some very well-paid careers and dubious honours, they still haven't found what they're looking for. Others have tried to explain our minds through observation of our behaviour like we would wild animals but have failed to nail it down because they've been looking from outside. Daft ideas like extreme male brains and absent empathy would be laughable if they weren't so damaging. In the midst of all this noise and failure, there have been genuine leaps forward that autistic people have embraced because they do make sense to us. They genuinely help us because they provide an insight into our own minds, and in doing so, enable us to build personal strategies that help us navigate a world which seems to sabotage us at every turn. If you've watched my previous work, you'll likely be familiar with the double empathy problem. Double empathy is the brainchild of Damien Milton, who's autistic himself and has autistic children. Discovering double empathy was one of those moments in my autism journey that put a huge enthusiastic smile on my face. Here was a theory that made sense to me that echoed my personal experience and ran parallel to observations I'd made about myself and autistic people I know. The same happened when I first read about monotropism. It made perfect sense. I could see myself in it, relate it to my experiences and just like double empathy, it described not only my weaknesses and failings, but also my strengths and triumphs. Again, it germinated in autistic minds those of Dinah Murray, Wen Lawson and Mike Lesser. Sadly, Dinah and Mike are no longer with us, but Wen is still working and writing in Australia. Monotropism is a theory about how the flow of our attention differs between autistic and neurotypical minds. Our attention is a finite resource. There's only so many things we can concentrate on before we start to make mistakes. The way we distribute our attention influences how we perform tasks, how we learn, how we mix with other people and even how we attend to basic needs. According to the theory of monotropism, the average neurotypical mind allocates significant attention to our surroundings, to the people nearby and to thoughts and plans unrelated to our current situation. On top of our main focus, there are hazards to watch out for, people we may want to respond to, physical needs like hunger and fatigue, emotional states and plans for what we may do next, say next or eat for dinner. If we had, for argument's sake, 10 attention points to spend at any given time, five might be addressed to the task at hand and the remaining five distributed amongst everything else. The monotropic mind allocates its resources very differently though. Eight or nine of those ten points are dedicated to the task, leaving only one or two to other possibilities. When our attention is all on one thing, it gathers a force of its own, a mental momentum if you like, and this makes it hard to change direction. We can't just drop everything and change tack when we're asked to, because there's so much mental force propelling us in one direction. If someone tries to talk to us or our stomach starts rumbling, we're not only less likely to notice, it may take us a lot longer to react and to work out how to respond when we do. We have to slow down before we can start peeling away attention points to allocate to the new task, and that takes time and effort. Say I'm talking to my friend Geoffrey in a coffee shop. We're chatting away about a story in the news, but then some of Geoffrey's other friends, Rod, Jane and Freddie, walk in and say hello to Geoffrey. With a neurotypical attention focus, I'd be wired to smoothly switch over to the new social situation. Instead of an intense one-on-one -on -one conversation with my friend, I'd shift to meeting new people mode. 
Rod comes over and instead of joining in to talk about the news, he asks if we saw the football last night. So now I'm shifting gear again, not only incorporating more people into my flow, but a new subject. Then Jane and Freddy sit down too and start looking at the snack menu and asking if the food here is any good. So the conversation moves in yet another direction. I'm constantly moving my attention from Jeffrey to his friends and back again. What started as two friends talking about one subject has transformed into a social gathering with the chat shifting between multiple topics. And because these people are new to me, I'm sizing them up too, judging whether or not I like them and want them to become my friends eventually. Rod seems to relate everything to football. Jane seems to have very strong opinions on everything, whilst Freddy seems keen to agree with everything Jeffrey says. The chat has twanged around between soap operas, football, reality TV, a George Clooney movie only Jane has seen, more football, the roadworks outside the cafe and the relative merits of Xbox series versus PlayStation 5. If I were neurotypical, my mind would be constantly flitting from one topic to the next. From Jeffrey to Rod to Freddy, then back to Rod, Jane, Jeffrey again and so on, depending on who was talking at the time. I'd be thinking about whether I agreed with them or not, and whether I should speak up when I disagree, pretend to agree with them, keep quiet or change the subject. As an NT, I'd likely enjoy the experience because in neurotypical terms, banter and socialising are considered distinct and worthwhile activities in themselves. The subject of the conversation, playing second fiddle to the act of conversing itself. The mythical NT version of me would be making new friends and building relationships. My real world monotropic mind can't shift gear in quite such a zippy manner though. I'm still rolling in current affairs mode and I not only feel lost talking to people I don't know about things that don't interest me, I'm disappointed that the meeting I was expecting has been derailed. It takes time for me to disengage my thoughts from the news and divert some attention to the new circumstances, so I don't have a lot to say at first. I'm quiet and relatively still whilst I pull mental brake levers and spin intellectual cranks to bring my steam train of thoughts to a halt so the points can be switched and I can head off in this new conversational direction. By the time I've managed to switch tracks, Rod and Freddy are already thinking I'm a bit weird and aloof. Jane thinks I disapprove of her strong opinions and Jeffrey's starting to think I don't like his other friends and suspects I might be a bit jealous. That was just one hypothetical example of how neurotypical interpretation of autistic monotropic minds can be completely bungled. Monotropism can be seen in far more than social situations. It contributes to executive functioning issues, a preference for routine and so-called autistic inertia. It's misinterpreted as disinterest, hostility, evasiveness, disdain or unwillingness and even causes people to worry if we're deaf or have sight problems because we don't respond or react quickly enough or do so out of context. On the other hand, it's what enables so many of us to hyper-focus on tasks or subjects so we get the job done. It funnels us into special interests, allowing us to build up expert levels of knowledge and understanding, and it can manifest in unexpected proficiencies because we've dedicated so much time and attention to a particular skill also encourages us to keep our social circles small and makes our social relationships more intense. Instead of a wide group of friends, some of whom we only know peripherally, we invest our people time into just one or two, whom we get to know incredibly well and may be fiercely loyal to. Monotropism may also play a role in one of the most defining features of the autistic triad, our veracity. Instead of keeping track of multiple interpretations of reality and pandering to the white lies, egotism, bias, competition, self-deception and spin of other people, we focus on the verifiable, the provable and the objective truth, or for some of us, dedication to their faith. Monotropism is one of the three theories of autism that have most impacted on my understanding of how my mind differs from the neuronormative majority. 
It not only made sense to me when I first heard of it, but I see it manifested every time I write about autistic life or talk about our distinctive nature with other autistic people. It's a huge concept which touches our lives in so many ways, and it's one I'll return to. How do you see monotropism in your autistic life, or the autistic people you know? Does it make sense to you and help you understand yourself better? Let me know in the comments. But until next time, thank you for watching. My attention is hyper-focused on helping both non-autistic and autistic people understand our lives and differences better. And you can help me by nudging the YouTube algorithm to spread the word by liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing on your own social media. The biggest contribution is made by my patrons on Patreon who make this channel possible and I'd love it if you would join them or buy yourself some exclusive autistomatic merch from TeePublic. Links to both are in the description.